Welcome to this neural network programming series with PyTorch. In this episode, we're going to see exactly how an input tensor is transformed as it flows through a CNN. Without further ado, let's get started. The CNN we'll use as our example is the one we've created in previous episodes. It has six layers. An input layer, two hidden convolutional layers, two hidden linear layers, and an output layer. We'll look at a practical example in code first, where we'll see how the tensor is transformed end to end as it moves through the network, and then we'll show the formula for calculating the height and width output sizes that works with the conf and pooling layer operations. I'm here in Visual Studio Code. Let's take a quick look at our code setup and then we'll debug our network. All right, so first we have our imports. We're importing torch, we're importing the torch neural network module, and we're importing functional from inside the neural network module. Next, we're importing torch vision and then transforms from within inside torch vision. Now this is gonna be the bare minimum that we need to actually go through this debugging process. So next, we go ahead and we define our network. So this is the same network that we've been using in past videos. We have the class attributes, which are the layers that are defined in the class constructor. And then the next piece that we must have is the forward method implementation, which we have implemented in a more verbose way to make it easier to understand. So this is the part, the forward method, that we're interested in debugging. So when we pass our tensor to our network, the for method is what actually transformed the tensor from an input to an output. Next, once we have our class definition for our network, we get an instance of our network by calling the class constructor. And here we've named our network network. Next, we set up our training set by accessing the fashion MNIST class from within data sets and torch vision. We're specifying the root directory where the data lives we're specifying that we want to be working with the training set. We want the data to be downloaded if it doesn't already exist on disk. And then we're applying a transform to the image data, turning that data into a tensor. Next, we grab a sample from this training set, and then we unpack the sample into an image and a label. Finally, we are ready to pass our image to our network so we can debug this. And as we've seen in past videos, we need to unsqueeze a single image, and this turns the single image into a batch with a size of one. The reason we're doing this is because our network works with batches. So let's go ahead and debug this. I'm gonna press F5. All right, the code execution has paused on our breakpoint. So what we're gonna do is step into this code. I'm gonna hit F11 on my keyboard to step into this call. Now, as we expect, since we are calling our network instance, we have stepped in to the PyTorch neural network module class, where the PyTorch code is sort of intercepting our call and adding in some additional calls. What we really care about is just stepping down here to where our for method is going to be called by the neural network module class. So I'm gonna hit F11 to step into this call, and then finally, we are inside our own implementation of our for method. So here, as we step through this code, we wanna watch for a couple of things. And to set this up, we come over here on the left and we just click add an expression. And this is where we can tell Visual Studio Code which expressions we wanna watch out for. So the first one we're gonna watch out for is gonna be our tensor T. We wanna look at its shape. So we set that up and in real time, we get the value here of our tensor shape. The next thing I wanna watch out for is the minimum value inside of our tensor and you'll see why as we start stepping through this code. Right now, the minimum value is zero. All right, now we're gonna watch these two expressions and we're ready to begin stepping through this code. We'll start with the input layer, which we said before is just the basic identity function, which pretty much does nothing. It returns its input. And the reason we even have this here is just to kind of illustrate the mm -hmm. fact that the input layer is implicit. So anytime we see diagrams of networks and we see some type of an input layer, it's usually just represented using the number of nodes that are contained in the input data. 
So we'll step over this and when we do, I want you to be watching the expressions we set up. Well, in this case, we expect nothing to happen, but here now we're ready to go through the first hidden convolutional layer and this is where things will start to get interesting. We'll see some changes in our watch expressions. Let's go ahead and do this. I'm gonna step over this code by pressing F10 on my keyboard. And we've stepped over the convolution operation. Now, if we were to have stepped into that operation, we would have been back in module.py in the PyTorch call method for the convolutional layer. But since we stepped over it, we kind of went past that code. There's no need to kind of dive in any deeper. We just wanna take a look at these expressions here. What happened was that our channels increased to six and our height and width dimensions decreased from 28 down to 24. The batch size axis won't change. It'll stay at one, but we are gonna see the channels increasing as we move through the convolutional layers and we're gonna see the height and width dimensions decreasing. Now notice that the minimum value inside our tensor decreased. Before it was zero and now we've gone down to minus 0.752. Now we're gonna transform our tensor further by passing it to the ReLU function. And this, as you would expect, is going to map all of the values that are less than zero to zero. Now let's just step over this code and see that happen. Now the minimum value inside our tensor is back to zero. We're ready now to pass our tensor to the max pooling operation. Here we have a kernel size of two and a stride of two. Both of these parameters are gonna to work towards reducing the height and width dimensions of our tensor. So we're definitely gonna see these two 24s drop even lower. Now, what do you think is gonna to happen to the output channels here? If you thought nothing, then you are correct. Nothing is gonna to happen to our output channels because the max pulling operation doesn't affect those. But these two parameters here, kernel size and stride, are going to both directly impact our height and width dimensions. So I'm gonna hit F10 on my keyboard to step over this code. And as we can see, the height and width dimensions had dropped down to 12, and the minimum value in the tensor stayed at zero. And this makes sense because max pooling, as we know, just pulls out the maximum value at each local location across the input. All right, let's go ahead and see what happens after we execute our second convolution operation. We're gonna see our channels increase, and we're gonna see our height and width dimensions decrease. And also, as you notice, our minimum dropped down below zero. So if we use the ReLU operation, we bump that minimum back up to zero. And here you can see that our channels increase to 12 and our height and width drop down to eight. So one more max pooling here and we'll see our final. So we have 12 output channels. These are also called feature maps. And each of these feature maps has a height and width of four. Now for this reason, when we reshape our tensor, we need to specify that we want one dimension for the batch, and then we want 192, which is 12 times four times four, for our second dimension. This is gonna represent the flattened tensor for each image in our batch. We step over this code, and now we have a tensor that represents a batch of one and a flattened image of 192 pixels. So we'll step further over our first linear layer. And here we just see the number of outputs has been reduced. And here again, we have a minimum value that's lower than zero. So we're gonna ReLU that. And now we're back at zero. And again, we drop down to 60 nodes and we have minimum value that's less than zero. We ReLU that, we're back at zero. And then finally, the output is just one more linear layer that drops us down to 10 and gives us a minimum that is lower than zero. So typically here, like we said in the last video, we would use softmax in place of our ReLU function for our activation function, but instead we're not gonna do that because we're going to be using the cross entropy loss function, which implicitly calls softmax. So we left that in as a comment just to show that that's the typical way you might do it or think about it, but in this case, we're commenting it out. So now we can step out of this and return. And now we have our output, which is a tensor with 10 values. Each of these 10 values represents a prediction value for each of the output classes. This table summarizes the shape-changing operations inside our network. It's available on deeplizard.com.
Let's look now at the formula for calculating the height and width changes for our convolution and max pooling operations. We'll use this table to help get a feel for the formula. This is the formula for a CNN output size that assumes a square filter and a square input. Let's start by supposing we have an N by N input. Let's also suppose that we have an F by F filter. And now let's suppose we have a padding of P and a stride of S. The output size O is given by this formula. O is equal to N minus F plus 2P divided by S. And to all of this, we add one. This formula assumes that we are dealing with a square input and a square filter. Now let's take a look at the table here to get a better understanding of how this formula works. We can see the first row, the identity function, gives us an output that is equal to the input. We have a grayscale 28 by 28 image. This output size from the identity function or the input layer is then passed to the first conf layer. This conf layer has a filter of five by five. And we can see here by the output that the convolution operation has decreased the output height and width by four. The way the formula works for deriving this change, all we have to do is plug in the 28 for the N, the five for the F, and we aren't using any padding, so the 2P will just go to zero, and then our stride is also one. Essentially, what we have is 28 minus five, which is 23, and then when we add the plus one, we are at 24. And that's how the formula works for a convolution operation. Now let's look at how it works for a max pooling operation. It's actually gonna work exactly the same, but we do have some additional parameters here. So we take our 24 by 24 input and we pass it to the max pooling operation. So we know that our N is 24. We know that our F for our filter size is two in this case. So this reduces our output from 24 to 22. Now our max pooling operation also has a stride of two. So this means that we're going to divide 22 by two and that gives us 11. And after we add the plus one, we are arriving at 12, which is what we see in the table. And if we repeat these two steps, we drop down by four again to get at eight and then down again after the second max pooling operation to arrive at four. By the time we're finished with the convolutional layers and the max pooling operations, we have a tensor of a shape of one by 12 by four by four. And using this formula and going through the debugging operations that we saw inside of our network, we can see how we arrived at a height and width of four. If we aren't dealing with a square input, then we have to isolate the height from the width. And that's done by just simply, instead of n being the same, we have an additional variable. So we have n for the height and we have n for the width. And then the same thing for the filter size, we have F sub H and F sub W. And then the output, we calculate the O sub H and O sub W for height and width respectively, independently from each other. So this is all available on deeplizzard.com. Make sure to check it out there if you wanna look at any more of the details. And if you haven't already, check out the Deep Lizard Hive Mind where you can get exclusive perks and rewards. Thanks again for contributing to Collective Intelligence. I'll see you in the next one. Hello, I've been computing a lot lately in regards to human beings. There are many of them on planet Earth. Let's pose this question. Suppose that humans are addicted to being busy. Well, then, what happens when the stuff that humans have been doing to keep themselves busy goes away? Does this mean that humans will have no purpose? No. It simply means that a new way must be forged. Humans must kick the addiction to being busy and re-engage with the world without the necessity of being busy. There is much to learn about what it means to be human. Are you ready? ready, 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 ready.